It's my honor to welcome tonight's speaker, Meredith Toulousen, who will be talking about her extraordinary memoir, Fairest. She is an award-winning journalist and author. They've written features, essays, and opinion pieces for many publications, including the New York Times, The Guardian, The Atlantic, Vice, Matter, Back Channel, The Nation, and The American Prospect. She's contributed to several books, including the New York Times bestselling Not That Bad, Dispatches from Rape Culture, edited by Roxane Gay. She's also a contributing editor at Them, Condé Nast's platform for the queer community. The New York Times said of Ferris, Toulouse sails past the conventions of trans and immigrant memoirs, rather than flaying her identities one by one, Toulouse examines the links between them to illustrate that it is here in the messy overlap that a person is made. And now, Meredith Toulouse. Hello, everyone. Um, I initially, when I was conceiving this talk, um, was thinking of it as, as a relatively informal talk, but it kind of became a proper lecture. So I hope um, you can indulge me. Um, but, you know, before I get into um, my lecture proper, I do want to give you a sense of the book. And so um, I'm going to be reading a small section from it. Um, the way that um, the book is organized, um, a reader um, wonderfully referred to it as a loose braid, which I hadn't thought of when I conceived it, but is a really beautiful metaphor. So there's a, there's a through storyline, a relatively chronological storyline from my past, you know, from, a, from the deep past starting in my early childhood. Um, all throughout, um, all to, through my transition. Um, and, um, but then interwoven are, um, are uh, vignettes from, um, from closer to the present. And um, this is one of those um, self-contained vignettes. Mm -hmm. May 2014, a month after I published my first article about being trans, I woke up at dawn between two naked men on the top floor of a townhouse in Park Slope. I'd followed the rules of street womanhood for over a decade and it hadn't made me happy. So I wanted to test my boundaries, push myself to be with people in ways I hadn't before. That was when Barrett and Jason came along, a bisexual couple I met online who were interested in dating a woman. I turned on my side to face Barrett, the one with whom I felt a stronger romantic attachment. Jason felt more like a friend I enjoyed having sex with. Bald and a decade older than me, Barrett had left his own rural upbringing in Alabama to become a modern dancer and interactive artist in New York, which led to a career as a digital consultant and allowed him to unexpectedly come into wealth. He and Jason didn't know I was trans when we first met, but I sent them one of my articles and, as I had hoped, as I had hoped they treated my gender as a non-issue. Barrett opened his eyes and smiled. I could tell they were hazel, but not much else. But I'd examined plenty of close-up eye pictures before and filled in details with my mind. Dark rings around his irises, dilated pupils because of the dim dawn light and maybe a little bit his attraction to me. He tilted his head to indicate that we should leave the room together. And I followed him down a set of wooden stairs with steel pipes for rails part of this couple's industrial aesthetic in a house they designed and renovated themselves. I'll get us some coffee, he whispered as he proceeded to the kitchen on the ground floor while I stayed on the second, an open area lined with bookshelves, a peacock green velvet couch on one side and a mid-century dining table on the other. Off that big room was a smaller room they used for guests. I noticed that the door was open, so I went inside. Barry and Jason also used the room as a walk-in closet. I noticed, I noticed a shelf of stylish shoes on one side, along with suits on wooden hangers. On another end of the room was a giant mirror, framed in ornate gold leaf, leaning against the wall. I stood in front of it and looked at myself as morning light illuminated my body and recalled how comfortable I'd been walking around nude in Barrett's presence. It was a relief to feel safe without clothes in, fr in front of someone else. After years of asking men to turn light off for fear they would find something overly masculine about my body, my two slim hips, my muscular shoulders and back from years of lifting weights, a fear that did not go away even when men admired that body 
for being powerful and athletic. Admiring yourself again, Barrett asked as he poked his head into the room, then went in to stand behind me. I'm sure it feels great to be almost 40 and have the breasts of a teenager. I laughed, not just at the joke, but at the openness of our relationship. The past decade, when I decided to be private about my transition, except to those I was closest to, the men I'd been involved with had accepted my history as fact, but had also been all too willing to deny its reality, something never to be discussed again once revealed. Though really, I was more responsible for this than they were, because their reticence was an echo of my own shame, my silence like trying to suffocate my history by refusing to breathe. It was such a relief to exhale. It's funny, Barrett continued as he stared at my reflection. I know you're trans, but I can't really tell. It's a lot harder to see you. You were an Asian man when I can't see you as Asian to begin with. To me, you're just a woman with a dancer's body. I nodded. I knew by woman, he meant white woman. I wanted to be pleased, but was surprised at myself that I wasn't. We left the room and had coffee at the dining table, but Barrett's words kept playing in my head. I don't see you as trans, coupled with, I can't tell you're Asian. The way he looked at me was exactly what I'd honed over many years, this trick of perception. And it puzzled me that I was dissatisfied over having accomplished it, a state of being so many trans women sacrificed so much to achieve. Maybe I didn't feel the satisfaction because I hadn't sacrificed too much, only had reassignment surgery, hadn't gotten implants or done facial feminization. The remaining undisclosed for a decade was burden enough. So it wasn't that. It was something about how my gender and race reflect out in each other, like a dizzying hall of distorted mirrors. When people look at me and only saw a white person, I understood that being white wasn't actually better, that I only coveted whiteness because of what I associated it with, wealth, education, and beauty. But for someone like me, whose whiteness was literally skin deep, who did not have any actual European ancestry, to be perceived as white could only mean that whiteness is nothing more than illusion. In an ideal world, I wouldn't need to go through so much effort, make so many sacrifices to gain the privileges of whiteness, and other brown people who are not albinos would have just as much access to those privileges if they wanted it. I flinched when Bear told me he only saw me as a woman because my experience with race forced me to understand that womanhood wasn't real either. I wanted to be a woman because I wanted other people to perceive my qualities through the lens of that gender. But having molded myself to their expectations, I now understood how much an illusion gender, gender was too. To become a woman in the world's eyes I made what felt like a huge sacrifice at the time, reassignment surgery, but in hindsight was really a cosmetic change, not unlike a nose job, a shift in a body part's aesthetic appearance while keeping its function intact. The only difference was the meaning our society invested in one body part versus the other. Had I lived in a world where men were allowed to dress and behave like women without being scorned or punished, I wouldn't have needed to be a woman at all. Over the following months, I grew alienated from Barrett and eventually stopped dating him. Not because he did anything terrible, but I just didn't want to see myself through his eyes. I came to understand that what I wanted was to be seen as my complete self, my gender, my race, my history, without being judged because of it. I wanted people close to me to see an albino person who had learned how to look and act white so the world would more readily accept her and understand how that had been a key part of her survival. I wanted to see pe people to see how that albino person was also transgender, how she transitioned to be able to express her femininity and had surgery so she would be perceived as being like any other woman, her qualities appreciated on those terms. And if she ever hid who she actually was, it was only so that she could be granted entrance into a world she couldn't otherwise reach, worlds that should rightfully belong to everyone, not just those who happen to uphold the prevailing standards of whiteness and womanhood. So um, 
that's my reading from Ferrist. Um, and um, I, I structured this lecture in two parts and I actually um, would like um, you to ask questions after part one because I figured it would be, you know, like it would be better for us and less boring if we, um, if, if we had a little break between the two parts of the lecture. Um, so, um, so here I go. Um, the first thing I can tell you is that I did not have a long-term ambition to write a memoir. Um, and it's probably the genre I'm least trained, practiced, and read in as someone who received a fiction MFA and went on to do a PhD program in comparative literature where I focused on um, post-colonial poetry. In fact, I was somewhat resistant to the genre itself, knowing how many trans women have participated in it. But I wanted to test that resistance by looking at trans women's memoirs that have been written up to, that, up to the point up to that point when I started Ferris back in 2015, when I became a staff writer at BuzzFeed News, a position I was hired for after a couple of op-eds I published while frustrated with my dissertation turned into a more or less accidental journalism career. One of the first articles I wrote when I started was a broad overview of trans women's memoirs that had been written up to that point for which I read a num I think I read about eight books in that genre, starting with Jeanne Morris's Conundrum and including Jean Jennifer Finney Boylan's She's Not There, as well as Janet Mott's Redefining Realness. Even though I had not read a large number of memoirs at that point, I was still really struck when I read these trans women's memoirs by the mode in which they were written. Regardless of how fascinating or gripping the trans women's life journey is, or how vividly that journey is rendered, there is in these memoirs the impulse to explain to non-trans people why someone found themselves making the perplexing decision to live as a gender different from what was determined for them at birth. Whether implicitly or explicitly, it's clear that part of the purpose of these memoirs is to justify the choices trans people make um, to, lead, uh, to lead more fulfilling lives often with a stated or implied plea for cisgender people to treat us with dignity and respect. The logic is that if we can make cis people understand why we've done this thing they find unfathomable, then maybe they'll stop discriminating, harassing, and inflicting violence on us. I want to illustrate this mode with a few examples. The first is British journalist Jan Morris's memoir, Conundrum, published in 1974 which has endured in large part because of Morris's vivid and precise writing. But there is also in her prose a clear desire to explain and destigmatize being transgender to her predominantly cisgender readers, which necessitates explanatory passages like this one. Now quote, whatever the cause, there are thousands of people, perhaps hundreds of thousands, suffering from the condition today. It has recently been given the name transsexualism, and in its classic form is as distinct from transvestitism as it is from homosexuality. Both transvestites and homosexuals sometimes suppose they would be happier if they could change their sex, but they are generally mistaken. The transvestite gains his gratification specifically from wearing clothes of the opposite sex and would sacrifice his pleasures by joining that sex. The homosexual, by definition, prefers to make love with others of his own sort and would only alienate himself and them by changing. Transsexualism is something different in kind. It is not a sexual mode or preference. It is not an act of sex at all. It is a passionate, lifelong, ineradicable conviction, and no true transsexual has ever been disabused of it. To a greater or lesser extent, this type of justification was a feature of every trans woman's memoir I had read up to that point. The one that feels most resonant to me is Deirdre McCloskey, who is um, you know, a really well-known economist, and her comparison of transness to migration in her 1999 memoir, Crossing. And I quote, most people would like to go to Venice on vacation. Most people, if they could magically do it, would like to try out the other gender for a day or a week or a month. A few people go to Venice regularly, and you can think of them as cross-dressers among these wearing the clothing of the opposite gender once in a while. But only a tiny fraction of the cross-gendered are permanent gender crossers. 
wanting to become Venetians. Most people are content to stay mainly at home. A tiny minor minority are not. They want to cross and stay. While I find McCloskey's metaphor imaginative, I also hear in her tone a desire to normalize transness by comparing it to life decisions that cis people make on a regular basis so that cis people can feel more comfortable with trans people. And for people who are not familiar with the term cis, it's short for cisgender, uh, which, which means people who live as the gender that they are assigned at birth. Um, it's a tone and way of approaching cis people I find galling and, and fundamentally incompatible with the way my own trans identity is constituted, maybe in part because I grew up in rural Philippines where third gender people were an embedded part of my culture. Also, because I have since, because I have since my earliest memories been a genetic anomaly as an albino person, it has just never made sense to me at a fundamental level that trans people should be thought of as deviant or abnormal just because we're a minority. I understand intellectually the various reasons why cis people are antipathetic toward trans people, whether political, social, or religious, and so I'm deeply aware of the effects of this hatred, but it's always been clear to me that if cis people are averse toward trans people, it's those cis people and not us who are being irrational. So it's just never been part of my impulse as a writer or person to justify my transness, because to do so would imply that being cis is by default better, Otherwise, there would be no reason for me to need to justify or explain being trans, right? So I have, for instance, unusually big ears. And in a, cult and in a culture where somehow that makes a meaningful difference and marks me as inferior, then I would have to explain them, right? Um, but, you know, but we don't do that, right? Um, so this is something I've just never felt at a fundamental level because the truth is that I love being trans and the only thing I don't love about it is having to be trans in a cisgender dominated society. I love having inhabited multiple genders and having gained a singular perspective as a result. I love feeling less restricted than most when it comes to the roles I'm expected to play because of my gender. I love, as an example, asking my husband for help setting up my new computer, then remembering that I was once a technical assistant at MIT who regularly maintain more than a dozen computers and realizing how much gender unconsciously sets parameters for people's behaviors. So to me, it feels completely unintuitive to try to justify my transness because to a large extent, I personally feel like being cisgender is actually the less preferable state of being. Sorry to cisgender people out there. Um, I don't mean that to be offensive. It's just a, it's just a, or, I don't know, provocative. It's just a statement of my own personal feelings. Um, but more than this, I felt like writing in this explanatory justifying mode hampered these trans authors because the burden of justification doesn't exist for cis writers. And even though I hadn't read many literary memoirs when I started to conceive theorist, the ones I had read were not written to justify the writer's choices to people. By and large, it felt like they were written either as forms of sex self-exploration, as a way of making sense of life events, or as literary works that have an even less defined purpose, a book based on life that exists simply because it's exciting, interesting, or beautiful. A memoir that stood out in my mind during that early period when I was conceiving Ferris was Joan Didion's A Year of Magical Thinking an account of the author's grief over recent grave losses she experienced. I want to read to you how Didion describes her impetus for writing the book. Nine months and five days ago, at approximately nine o'clock in the evening, on the evening of December 30, 2003, my husband, John Gregory Dunn, appeared to, or did, experience at the table where he and I had just sat down to dinner in the living, living room of our apartment in New York a sudden massive coronary event that caused his death. Our only child, Quintana, had been for the previous five nights unconscious in an intensive care unit at Beth Israel Medical Center Singer Division, at that time a hospital on East End Avenue. It closed in August 2004, more commonly known as Beth Israel North or the Old Doctors Hospital, where with what had seemed a case of December flu sufficiently severe to take her to an emergency room on Christmas morning 
had exploded into pneumonia and septic shock. This is my attempt to make sense of the period that followed, weeks and then months that cut loose any fixed idea I had I had ever had about death, about illness, about probability and luck, about good fortune and bad, about marriage and children and memory, about grief, about the ways in which people do and do not deal with the fact that life ends, about the shallowness of sanity, about life itself. I have been a writer my entire life. As a writer, even as a child, long before what I wrote began to be published, I developed a sense that meaning itself was resonant in the rhythms of words and sentences and paragraphs, a technique for withholding whatever it was I thought or believed behind an increasingly impenetrable polish. The way I write is who I am or have become, yet this is a case in which I wish I had, ins I had instead of words and their rhythms, a cutting room equipped with an avid, a digital editing system on which I could touch a key and collapse a sequence of time, show you simultaneously all the frames of memory that come to me now, let you pick the takes, the marginally different expressions, the variant readings of the same lines. This is a case in which I need more than words to find the meaning. This is a case in which I need whatever it is I think or believe to be penetrable, if only for myself. What stands out to me in this passage are the lines, this is my attempt to make sense of the period that followed and the ending, if only for myself. Unlike Morris and McCloskey, Didion's memoir is not about her explaining and justifying her experience to other people, but rather the author grappling with enormous complexities of her experience for her own sake. And whatever the reader gleans from that grappling isn't laden with the evaluation of whether or not that reader would find the author worthy of their respect or acceptance. But just imagine if we lived in a society where one is expected to forget a person once they've died, one where grief is an emotion that people don't think is justified or even fathomable. And imagine if Didion's book was framed not as your own meditation on the nature of grief based on life experience, but as a way for her to justify grieving to people who don't understand grief as a reaction to a loved one's death. That mode of writing just feels necessarily reductive to me because when you tell a story to someone who doesn't understand you, you end up needing to frame the story according to that other person's expectations. And if one of your goals in telling that story is to have them respect and accept you, then it becomes really tempting, even necessary to keep the parts of your experience that might be unappealing away from them. Yet elements like long-windedness, over-justification, and self-censorship are often so detrimental to good writing. So expecting trans writers to engage in these modes just for our writing to be valid seems to me to be grossly unfair. Doing this, doing this contradicts the core values of exemplary memoir writing, interiority, subjectivity, vividness, unsparing honesty. So it seemed to me that to write a literary memoir that's exciting in the ways people generally find literary memoirs to be exciting, a trans woman would have to risk cisgender people thinking of her as someone who isn't deserving of respect or equal treatment. I felt like I was in a unique position to take that risk as someone who didn't grow up in the West and absorbs hatred against trans people differently as a result but also as someone who very much relishes literature in its most exciting forms. Writing a memoir felt to me like an opportunity to present a rendering of trans womanhood that has no justification other than itself. I wanted to position the cisgender reader not as the person I'm speaking to, but a person who's witnessing me trying to figure out my own transgender trajectory for myself, which is something that I don't think many trans people are able to to do because the pressure on us to perform for cisgender people is so strong, especially given that a big part of how we've historically been able to obtain medical and legal access was through, was through very much through such a performance. That's the end of the first part of my lecture. So um, I would love to take uh, a couple of questions um, before we continue, just so that um, oh. We'll just so that jump I back in here. you know, there's not too much yeah, of me drawing on. Uh, voice a couple of questions if that sounds good. Um, 
so someone comments, what invaluable insight. So no, no drowning <laughs> in the early review. Um, and this person asks, um, can you talk a little bit about the difference between performative and genuine activism? And I am adding to that, thinking of especially the episode in the book where you're at Harvard and participate in the, um, you may know the episode I'm thinking of. I don't quite know how to describe it. Yes. <laughs> yes, that's the one. Yeah. In a, in a Ralph Reed protest, yes. Um, a gender bending Ralph Reed protest. Um, I think it's an, it's an interesting question. I don't think that there is, I, I think it's, you know, it, it's sort of like that line, you know, the, the um, about, you know, kind of pouring, you know, it when you see it, right? That I don't necessarily think that there is a clear line in terms of what is performative and what is genuine. Especially, you know, like especially now um, that so much activism happens digitally. Um, so I think there are different ways to conceive that, right? Like one is definitely intention. Um, I think it's really important, it's been really important for me to introspect my motivations for engaging in activism. Um, and so, and, you know, like, and, and it's always really important to query that and like, and what, and often those motivations are mixed, right? Like it doesn't have to be necessarily the case that, oh, you know, like I have this, you know, like it can simultaneously coexist that you, you can be deeply committed to racial and gender equality while at the same time, especially if you're a white or cis person, know that, you know, like it, it scores you a certain amount of social points in certain circles to be committed to those causes, right? Like those things are not mutually exclusive, but when one outweighs the other, um, either in your actions or your intentions, then I think that's when activism begins to that's um, extremely you know, good. Be and I begins think to enter the territory of very being performative. Welcome. Um, so we have a question of, with the pandemic and social distancing in full effect, I wonder if you've noticed that aspects of the social performance you spoke of have morphed. I think you kind of edging into that a little bit. Um, can you talk more about that a little bit? Mm -hmm. uh, let me just, yeah, let me just, I think I swallowed it. Let me say it again. With the um, pandemic sorry, and social distancing in full effect, question. I wonder if you've noticed that aspects of the social performance you spoke of have morphed. Yeah, I mean, I feel like, well, there, you know, there's this really fascinating, um, I think, you know, Jenna Wortham wrote, um, um, who's, who's a, you know, who's a good friend and is brilliant, wrote an article about this, that there was sort of this, pent up energy, right? Like so during the pandemic, you know, like people hadn't been out for months and people were sort of like collectively glued to their screens and were collectively alert to what was going on online in a way, and there were fewer distractions. And I think, you know, like, and I think that really sort of like coalesced into the social movement that we saw in May, um, against, you know, the, against anti-Blackness and police brutality. And I think that that was, you know, the, that's super, super insightful in her part, you know, because I think there's something about, like, we we all knew that it was happening, but there was something about our collective witnessing of it and so many of us witnessing it at the same time that made it feel so undeniable. Um, and I think, I think that that really sort of, um, in a lot of ways, um, moved, you know, like so many of us who had not been involved in, especially um, in anti-Blackness yeah, activism absolutely. before, to really, um, you know, to sort of really maybe put, a, put our foot Have you there. noticed a shift in, I don't know, if your own perception or people you've talked with, the sort of requirements for performance of gender or presentation of gender since we're interacting more through screens the last few months 
Yeah, I mean, I feel like it's funny just because, you know, um, I am a person who has been wearing onesies since 2015, really, um, because, and I enjoy them because they're gender neutral. Um, and you don't assume my gender as a result of them. And it's been really interesting how, you know, like how the sort of like home environment allows us to, um, you know, like allows us to express ourselves. I think, you know, like I said something on Twitter that, you know, there are a lot of, there, there have been a lot of trans people I've spoken to who feel a lot of relief from not having to perform their gender in public, right? Um, you know, like being able to work from home, being able to choose whether to turn on or turn off their, um, you know, their, um, their cameras has definitely um, been, you know, like one, maybe like, you know, one of the few silver linings um, in the situation. And maybe, you know, like maybe that can extend to, um, you know, to live life and experience once we're um, fully out of, yes, I've hopefully seen some of that out already. of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Um, someone asks, of what role did your relationship to your parents you? play in your identification as trans? Huh, that's a good question. I don't necessarily, I mean, first of all, like I'm not, um, I wasn't particularly close to either of my biological parents, but I was deeply, deeply close and was raised by my grandmother. And I, I definitely think like having like a strong, um, you know, like such a strong, wonderful female role model growing up, you know, like made me, you know, just really made me value women. Um, and, but I don't necessarily think that's because, um, you know, like that my grandfather was also, you know, was also wonderful and was available to be, you know, to be a role model. I just tended to gravitate towards my grandmother. So. Um, all right, so I'm gonna continue uh, with the second part of um, this lecture. Um, what I knew implicitly, intuitively, when I began writing Ferris was that my account of how I figured out I'm trans would have to begin with an account of how I came to perceive myself as white and how I continue to do so despite my conscious knowledge of how pernicious that is. And when I say I perceive myself as white, I want to be clear that I know I'm not white. I, um, nor do I consciously want to be white. What I mean is that when I look in the mirror, I can't actually perceive myself as an albino Asian person. I imagine that this is because I learned from my earliest memories that being albino makes me freakish, while being white makes me superior in the post-American brainwashed, post-American occupation, brainwashed Philippine province I grew up in. And my unconscious mind is protecting myself from all the stigma attached to being an albino person, someone who is not only marginalized, but in, is in many cultures actively persecuted. Um, it's really tough to find a metaphor for this experience, but it's convenient that when I mentioned I was a cognitive science technical assistant at MIT, I worked for Edward Adelson, who is well known in the field for his work on visual illusions. So I'm really attuned to gaps between perception and reality. So you have to go with me. I'm gonna be a little bit scientific. One of Adelson's most famous illusions is called the checkerboard illusion. And I am going to share my screen in order to show it to you. Um, let's see. Uh, of course, now my Uh, let me, it's being slow, I apologize. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, I'm sharing my screen and then I'm gonna go to, um, all right, to this figure. I hope people can see that. Um, is it visible? 
And, um, and cover the rest of the, image, of the image with your hands and just look at those two squares that are marked A and B. You can actually, you'll actually see that they're the same shade of gray. Um, but the reason we perceive A as darker and B as lighter is because in this context, it's useful for us to be able to determine the differences between the light and dark squares. And so our mind enhances those shading differences. The image would be a lot more confusing if we actually saw square A and B as the same, even though that's what they objectively are. So it's useful for a mind to perceive something that's not objectively true. Um, and and I, I'm going to caveat um, objectively because, because what we perceive as objectively true isn't objective at all, right? Like our eyes are also, um, you know, like are not objective. Other creatures' eyes perceive other things. Um, but that's just me being a science nerd at this point. Um, similarly, it's been useful throughout my life for me to perceive myself as white along with all of its positive connotations rather than albino and all of its negative ones. Its uses range from me being able to easily counter assumptions as a child that I might be mentally impaired because I'm albino and for me to engage in activities that are often ruled out for albinos like me, who are typically partially blind and extremely sensitive to light. Um, this includes an MFA. I actually have a previous MFA in visual art before I got my MFA in fiction and many years of training in, um, uh, this includes an MFA in visual art and many years of training in dance, fields in which normal vision is often assumed. I didn't really start to question the broader effects of my racial passing until I read Toni Morrison's The Bluest Eye in my late 20s. That novel brutally, brutally renders its main character, Pecola, uh, Pecola Breedlove's irrational wish to have blue eyes as the ultimate symbol of her fundamental self-hatred and perception of irrevocable inferiority. I want you to read a passage from the book that portrays uh, uh, Pecola's psyche. It had occurred to Piccola some time ago that if her eyes, those eyes that held the pictures um, and knew the sights, if those eyes of hers were different, that is to say beautiful, she herself would be different. Her teeth were good, and at least her nose was not big and flat like some of those who were thought so cute. Maybe they'd say, why well, look at pretty eye Piccola. We mustn't do bad things in front of those pretty eyes. And then there's a passage that sort of, uh, um, that portrays Piccola's interior monologue based on um, children's books, right? Pretty eyes, pretty blue eyes, big blue pretty eyes. Run, Chip run, Chip runs, Alice runs. Alice has blue eyes, Trey has blue eyes. Cherry runs, Alice runs. They run with their blue eyes, and so on and so forth. Each night, without fail, she prayed for blue eyes. Fervently, for a year, she prayed. Although somewhat discouraged, she was not without hope. To have something as wonderful as that happen would take a long, long time. Imagine reading this as a brown person, as someone with no European blood, who happens to have the very blue eyes of Piccola, another brown so person so fervently wishes for but can never get. Imagine reading about that wishes devastating effects on Piccola's psyche and life. That was the beginning of my understanding that in order for me to feel good and affirmed and beautiful, as a person who perceives myself as white, it is necessarily true that those whose lives and fates I am more akin to must suffer because my illusory feelings of superiority about being white cannot exist without the converse assumptions of inferiority that dark-skinned people live and experience. As Franz Fanon notes in his vital dissection of black psyche, Black Skin, White Masks, another book that permanently affected my understanding of my whiteness. Quote, for not only must the black man be black, he must be black in relation to the white man. It's the white man's position of superiority that allows him not only to determine black men as inferior to him, but also gives him the freedom to conceive of his being beyond the boundaries of race. Having coped with my perceived inferiority throughout my life, 
by chaining my self-perception to whiteness. White supremacy has robbed me of the ability to see and understand myself outside of that illusion. Whatever sense of being I have must be interpolated through that lens. And I do feel like this loss is in a lot of ways greater than the assumption that whiteness is superior. It's the loss of an ability to conceive of a world where skin color has no value, a world where our beings are not determined by this arbitrary feature of our bodies. I did not read either Morrison or Fanon until after transition. In fact, I managed to obtain an English degree at Harvard, having read hardly any authors of color, a path I chose at a time when I had only been in the US for three years and wanted so desperately to figure, it, to figure out how to belong in my wealthy white dominated society. I imagine that, that had I been more cognizant of passing's pernicious effects, my transition might have taken on a different form. Because once again, contrary to assumptions about trans people that have been, that have been shaped by cisgender expectation, I don't consider my transition as in any way inevitable. The reason why my trans narrative has to start with race and it is thus probably clearly distinct from other trans narratives, since it's highly unlikely that there are any other trans Filipino first generation immigrant albinos out there. I wish there were, I wish there, there were people I can talk to about this experience, um, is because the fluidity of my race made me more intuitively sensitive to the degree to which race is an illusion. And so when I first dressed in women's clothes for drag night in college, Contrary to previous assumptions, the trans women's feelings about transness have to be early and persistent. The discovery that just putting on a dress caused people to perceive me as a woman incited my curiosity about exploring the illusion of gender too. The way we've divided, ordered, and stratified society based on assumptions about each other's genitalia. Ironically, a big part of the reason why I was able to adopt the convincing illusion of womanhood during my time as a gay man was precisely because of people's mistaken perception that I am white. As a white woman, I'm of average height and build, whereas I would be perceived quite differently if people were to apply their perception of Asian womanhood onto my body. I don't think I would have transitioned had I not been so readily perceived as a woman. I'm not even sure if I would have transitioned had I not been perceived as beautiful, my beauty and my whiteness inextricably linked even when beauty has eventually turned out not to be a major factor in my love of both my womanhood and my transness. I am able to tell you this because being two decades beyond my gender transition and not feeling visceral inferiority about being a trans person, I am not invested in whether cisgender people would consider my gender invalid because I didn't feel the tortured ingrained feelings they expect of me that I didn't inordinately suffer in order to find my authentic self, that I didn't let go of my cisgenderedness only after realizing that I had no other choice. I did have a choice and I chose to be trans because I like being trans better than I like being cisgender. And I like being a woman more than being a man. And I like being non-binary over being someone who firmly belongs in a binary gender. Given the gender itself is an outdated social construct, in a society where ingrained gender roles severely limit everyone's potential, in a country where predominantly white men, and especially an orange one, sorry, I couldn't resist, um, have grossly compromised their democracy, in a planet that's fast running out of resources for future children, I prefer to be a person who chooses to question gender rather than a person who adheres to its oppressive and, obs and obsolete rules. Thank you. As a uh, um, response to that whole thing, I'm gonna quote what somebody has put in the chat. I just purchased your memoir. Your lecture is amazing. I love your passion, including for science. We need more nerds. So I think that's, <laughs> a, that's a pretty good, well, well, yes. pretty good message. Count me. Oh, definitely count me among those, yes. Um, and someone comments, um, I don't have a question, but do want to say how much I appreciate hearing your thoughts about memoir and your comparison to memoirs like Joan Didion's, which really brought home to me, says this person, the differences in stories that other trans writers and others have written where they might have felt the need to justify and encourage empathy from cis readers. 
so impressed that you were able to bypass that urge, an urge you might not even have felt. Um, if you want to speak to that, you're welcome to give, I'll give more as a comment, I thought. Yeah, uh, you know, like I do think, I mean, it's sort of, it's one of those things where like, I was aware of the urge as an urge I'm supposed to have, you know, like there was this sort of like meta awareness of the urge and this sort of, and, you know, and, and definitely as the book was getting closer to publication and people were just like, really, you know, like this is what you're doing. You know, like the, I was definitely, I definitely caught a little bit of this sort of like secondhand anxiety. Um, but I don't know, like, I just, I just felt like I had spent so much time as a trans journalist, um, you know, like in this mode of explaining all of these different aspects of our lives to, um, you know, to a broadly, a largely cisgender public, that I didn't, I didn't want to do that with my own story. Um, and that was just like a really, you know, like that was a really clear, um, you know, self-driven edict on my part. Very good. Um, so other audience members do feel free to throw comments or questions into the chat. I'm going to add in one of my own, as I already mentioned to our speaker, one of the things I loved about the book is the uh, dominance of bits and pieces of theater and how they were big influences on you and inspired different reactions at different times, especially musical theater. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, Tony Kushner's Angels in America, which is very much a central text for me, and I think for a lot of people as well, um, that phrase, uh, this is the threshold of revelation uh, and things like that. So can you talk a little bit about um, any of those elements, but maybe particularly um, theater as kind of an escape and also a way of experimenting with different roles and social opportunities? Yeah, I mean, I was definitely deeply engrossed with theater throughout undergrad. I directed, you know, like I directed multiple shows. I did, you know, like I did, you know, like I did that performance piece, which, um, you know, like features really prominently in the book. But I think for me, um, the lore of musical theater specifically is just this, this kind of like, this sort of heightened alternative reality, right? Like it just feels you know, like in a musical theater setting, you know, like everything just feel like there's a sense in which I think things feel more possible because if it's possible to live in a beautiful world where, you know, anybody can just break into song at any time, you know, and, and have that be accepted and just be completely wonderful, like somehow, you know, somehow crossing the gender threshold doesn't seem so incongruous or, you know, like, or strange, right? And I think, you know, like I was particularly drawn to Stephen Sondheim's musicals. And I, you know, like I spent a significant amount of time talking about specifically one of his more obscure ones, Passion, um, in the book, because of the fact that I think he, like me, really enjoys dwelling in the complex, you know, like, I, you know, this, this memoir doesn't have this sort of like, you know, this like trajectory of, you know, I was, I was a lost person and then I'm trans and everything was good, right? Or, you know, like, or I suffered and now I don't suffer anymore. Like I, I'm really interested in, you know, like getting into that, into the muck of things, into the complexity of things. And then, you know, sort of like hopefully coming out with, you know, with something worthwhile at the end. Um, yeah, um, I'm just, I, I have been informed by my computer that it's running out of battery. So I'm just gonna plug, plug myself in, hold on one second. But, but you ask, you continue to ask questions, I can still hear you. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna read one that just popped up here, let's see. Do you have any recommendations for cisgender women writers who don't want mm -hmm. to reinforce a binary construct of gender, but at the same time want to be able to speak to their own experiences as a cis woman and reference research that is cis-centric slash binary, do you think we need to remind our readers consistently throughout the book or is, or is an introduction sufficient or is including that in an introduction sufficient? I hope I... Yeah, I, I think it really depends. I think it really depends on context, right? You know, like I feel like one of one of the um, 
I, I just read um, Ursula Le Guin's uh, Steering the Craft, which is, I, we were talking about um, reading The Left Hand of Darkness earlier, which is a really amazing science fiction book, but she also wrote kind of a writer's manual called Steering the Craft. And she talks about a lot about, you know, sort of like how there's sort of, um, she calls it the exposition lump where you trying to prevent the exposition lump of having to sort of explain all of this information um, because she's building a completely new world, right? Like if I, if I set my book in New York in the 1990s, at least people have a sense of what that is. But if it's like some intergalactic universe, right? Like, you know, you have to build the world from scratch, right? Um, and one of the jobs of the writer is to, you know, is to include, sneak in the information without the reader getting overwhelmed. And I think, I think it's possible to do that as a cisgender woman writer, whether that means, you know, kind of like, if it's in fiction, you know, kind of like having a character, even, an, even a minor character who is trans or gender non-binary, um, if it's in, you know, like if it's in nonfiction or if it's in memoir, just having, you know, kind of like a brief passage about, you know, the ways in which you conform, one conforms or doesn't conform to the expectations of one's gender. And I feel like everybody, to some extent, has confronted um, gender expectation, right? Um, you know, like, I don't think anybody's gender is fully aligned in terms of, you know, like in term at all times in terms of, um, you know, like in terms of their gender corresponding to the other people's expectations of them or their behavior as um, as a gendered person corresponds. Yeah. Thank you. Um, a question regarding identifying as non-binary and speaking towards a future mm -hmm. world where we can let go of the gender binary. Do you feel based on your own experience a willingness in the trans community to move beyond gender, or is there also some resistance? I mean, I feel like everybody conceives of their gender differently and different people have different attachments, right, to binary or non-binary gender. For me, the way that I explain my gender is that I am, I am a woman in the world as it currently exists because in the current, well, not necessarily in, in the world as it currently, in, in a world that assumes binary gender. Um, I am a woman because, um, you know, because of the fact that I am, I, I am definitely more aligned with womanhood broadly constituted than manhood. But, you know, in an ideal world, I do not believe in, um, in the validity of binary genders, right? Um, in my, you know, like in my dream world, binary genders wouldn't exist. Um, and other people, uh, you know, like people have other people have other conceptions, and I think there there are definitely trans people who have like a really strong embedded binary notion of gender. Um, I find those people increasingly rare, and I find people who like trans people who are threatened by the notion of non-binaryness increasingly rare. Um, but at the same time, you know, at the same time, I you know, like I run in circles where there are a lot of non-binary people and, you know, like I live and I'm in a particular, you know, sort of like place and time, right? Um, so we'll see, you know, um, we'll see what happens as, you know, people's conceptions of gender evolve. Um, and just because, you know, and also just because I don't, I also don't feel like um, if binary gender, if the assumption of binary gender doesn't exist, you know, it, it may still be possible for people to decide that they want to be men or women, right? Like it, that doesn't preclude that possibility. So I think we may kind of move towards wrapping up. I, I was gonna pitch in one more question. If anybody else has anything else they'd like to add, now would be a good time. Um, so, oh, we have a, a, one more question in the chat. Um, have you seen Sebastian, I may be mispronouncing this, Sebastian Lelio's film, Fantastic Woman? Do you think the main character characterized the experience of a trans woman? I have, I have not 
I have not seen, I have fortunately not seen Fantastic Woman, even though I'm familiar with it. Um, and I've seen, um, and I've seen like a, a couple of scenes from it. So unfortunately, I can't speak to it. Um, so, but, but I will now that now that you've mentioned it because I'm curious <laughs> to answer to answer that question. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to highlight um, so much of the literature that's referenced in the book, and including a lot of 19th century literature, which became very important to you personally and in your studies. And one of the things that really struck me, it seemed to me, was how surprisingly, or maybe this was just me being surprised, but surprisingly modern, you found some writers like George Eliot and Christina Rossetti, who often I think we think of as the classics, but they're kind of on a classic shelf and don't necessarily feel modern. Is that just my perception or? Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I just, I've never, I, I don't, I guess I was trained by people who didn't necessarily think of, you know, the period in which, uh, you know, like a work of literature was written as, you know, as limit uh, the the sort of like social implications of the writing, you know, definitely, you know, extend on and on, right? Um, and I and I and I think, um, you know, like that was a that was an attitude that I was really encouraged to have in undergrad. Um, and so that was pretty intuitive for me, um, you know, to sort of like find resonances in contemporary life, you know, just because, I, you know, the, the fact is that patriarchy is still, you know, this this huge weight on all of our shoulders. And, um, and I think, unfortunately, it's going to be for a, a good while longer, I think. Um, and so, um, and so I do think that reading um, women writers from that period, um, you know, like, is, is a great way for people to sort of, for people to, to think of and refract the experiences we're having today. Yeah, very true. I think a lot of our readers at the library have had some of that same experience. Um, great. So what's coming next for you? Next project? Something we should look forward to? We're here in a novel. I am. I'm working on a novel and working on fiction, which I'm really, which I'm really enjoying. I'm really, um, you know, just sort of. I think, I think having been having written about my life for such a long period of time, it's been, and also like in this period, it's really wonderful to sort of like escape into a world of my own making that I have some control over. <laughs> given the, you know, given the day-to-day -day lack of control um, in the rest of the world. Very true. Well, great. I'm sure we'll look forward to it. Um, so I think we'll wrap up there. I'm happy to in include uh, if there's anything else you'd like to add, but thank you so much on behalf of the library and everybody present. We so appreciate it. No, I, I, I just wanted to thank you for inviting me and everyone, um, you know, who's there virtually. I wish, you know, I could interact with you um, in, you know, like, it, it's very strange to, um, you know, to have written a memoir that is so much about embodiment and yet be so, disem you know, be so disembodied, right? Um, but hopefully, you know, um, once, the paperback gets published, hopefully I will be able to interact with some of you in person. Yes. Um, yeah. Good. Well, we're very grateful to have you with us in this form and other things to come in the future. So thank you so much. Um, thank you so much.